idea of overcoming and how you can make good choices when it's tough. And we're going to spend the entire time. I think I have one verse that's not in the book of Daniel. So if you have your Bible or you have your Bible app, you can turn there. Or it'll be on the screen. It's in your notes. And you can look all this up later. If you haven't read the story of Daniel, especially the beginning uh, of the book of Daniel, it tells the whole story. Um, uh, take some time to read that later today. It's great. And, um, and I think you'll really get a lot out of it. Now, here's a question for you. And you've seen this. How can some people seem to go through adversity and they do great? They pick themselves up, they, they get things together, and then other people go through the smallest trial and seem to get stuck face down. They, they can't get up. I want to encourage you today, and I want you today, these principles that I'm going to give you from the story and from Daniel. We're not really going to talk about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego very much, or Rakshak and Benny, as some people call them. We're going to really look at Daniel, and we're going to talk about this. The Bible says that God wants us, or we should be as Christians, more than overcomers. And it says that we're more than conquerors. That's the idea of somebody who has victory. And so today we're going to talk about some principles, how we can have victory, how we can overcome the trials of life. Now, I don't know if you've ever, you've got to pretend that this is a piece of wood and not a pool cue, okay? I'm not getting ready to play pool. So forgive me, I forgot to bring my little piece of wood from home. Um, but if you stake a tree, you know what I'm talking about, stake a tree? If you transplant a tree, now it's not the same for um, uh, palm trees, but any other kind of tree, a regular tree, when you stake a tree, they say, um, and if you see it done well, usually there's two stakes and then either rope or some type of bungee or something. And normally it's not staked too tight. They've actually discovered that if you stake a tree too tight, like if I put stakes all around a tree to support it, that that tree will actually be weaker. Whereas if you stake a tree and you give it just enough support to help it, but you allow it to bend in the wind, it actually makes it stronger. They've discovered that a tree without wind will actually just fall over. The trees need the wind in order to strengthen uh, uh, the, the bark and all the things inside Xylem and Phloem. <laughs> I'd use a science, a couple of science words that I randomly remembered in my head for no reason. Here's what I want you to know about you and about your children, especially. When you're going through life, you cannot avoid pain. When you're going through life, you cannot avoid trials. Even if you sat at home all day and hid in your house, you cannot avoid, you would have back pain. There would be something in your life that would not be good. You'd lack relationships. You'd begin talking to volleyballs, you know, all the stuff that begins to happen, right? So in life, you cannot avoid pain. You cannot avoid trials. And God even allows those trials into our lives to form us in his image, to strengthen us. But as long as we hold on to him, he will never let us fall over and never get back up. He will be there. Now, I want to tell you the same thing about your children. If you support your children too much, if you give them too much protection, if you never let them fall and then let them get themselves up, they will never learn how to get up. And when they're 50, they'll still live with you. And you'll be supporting them. Some of you are like, okay, we got to let those kids loose right now, right? <laughs> Today we're going to look at this idea of why some people fail and fall and other people fail and never seem to get up. They, they go down and they don't seem to go up. So let's look first at these five things. Why we don't overcome after a failure or loss. And these are some of the common things that happen. Number one, we lose hope. And we assume that tomorrow is like today. Hope is the idea that something's going to change. And when somebody gets depressed or totally discouraged, what begins to happen is your brain starts to say... It's always going to be this way. And when you start to hear somebody despair that way, then you need to really pay attention because they could be moving into depression or worse. Number two, we focus on the pain, loss, and hurt. By the way, I had an awesome Facebook post yesterday, if I must say so myself. I just... <laughs> because here's what I know, and it's, and it's true for you. <laughs> Thanks, yeah, somebody clapped. For my, you shouldn't have clapped for that. You should look at me and boo. But anyway, so, but here's the truth, because I deal with it and you deal with it. We tend to focus on our hurts. 
We tend to focus on people who've hurt us. And here's the deal. They've actually done scientific studies. Your brain hangs on to the negative quicker than it hangs on to the positive. Did you know that? They've actually done scientific studies. When the sin nature came into the world, one of the things that it caused is for you to go to a job evaluation and you walk in and your boss tells you a thousand things you're doing great and says this one thing you need to work on and all you can think about is that one thing you need to work on or how unfair that was or whatever. I'll never forget years ago, I had a principal and he came into my classroom and he loved everything. He loved the way I taught. He loved the way I did stuff. I used to do ceiling notes. I think he came in one day. I was doing ceiling notes is when you could take those predictions. I put them on the ceiling and as long as all the kids took notes, they could lay on the floor in my classroom. This is why I don't teach anymore. But anyway, so they would let, I also had them push a bus one day, but that's another story. I was teaching them inertia. What do you want? Anyway, so. So, so they're laying on the floor taking notes. He walks in, you know. But anyway, so he can back in my class. Awesome. Everything was great. He wrote down that my books in the back were not organized. Do you know the only thing I could remember after all the things he said for years? For, not for days. Not for, to this day, I just said it. It was over 20 years ago. And I just told you what he said. I don't remember anything positive he said. But I remember he said, your books weren't in order in the back of your room. All I can think about. Somebody has hurt you in your life, and you will focus on them instead of loving the person next to you. Today, something will happen that will bother you, and you'll focus on that instead of the people next to you. Hey, how many times have you yelled at somebody in another car, but you've never blessed the person that's in the car with you? So let's take a moment, just look at the person next to you, smile, pat them on the back, whatever you think you need to do. Don't get weird on me. Say sorry. All right? Sorry. Number three ties into the same thing. We focus on those who attacked us or left us. And sometimes we, we take those feelings with us. So if, when we get around anybody, we feel attacked or we feel abandoned. Number four, we compare our lives to others. I got to do this with my, all my hillbilly or the good old days. I remember the good old days back when we... I remember when all the lights, you could go to the beach on US-1 and all the lights to Titusville, that right lane all the way to the McDonald's had all go and you didn't have to stop. I could get to the back from the beach in 15 minutes. Blam, blam, blam. My kids are like that. You tell us this every single time we go to the beach. <laughs> yeah, but it's true. I remember when that, and I'm not even 50 and I'm already doing that. Blam, the good old days. Had my convertible Mustang in high school that I had to fix every weekend, but I forgot that part. But we focus on the good old, and we compare our lives to others. So we look at our lives, and we're like, oh, they got a nicer car. I wish I had a car like that. No, you don't. They don't like their payment. Number five, five. We forget, this is huge, that God can use tragedy for good. Not only that, let me tell you something about you. God can use that tragedy in your life, and it may be your ministry. It was the very thing that he will use. It's the very thing that caused the most pain in your life. He may not use it directly by what happened, but he will use that pain in your life to make you sensitive and more caring if you let him. You can become bitter and cynical and withdraw and all those things, but if you allow God to work on you, it will become your ministry. Now, I'm going to do a different kind of sermon today, and you may not like it, so you just have to tell me later if we hated that. But we're going to involve a little bit of archaeology and a little bit of stuff in here because uh, we're going to talk about Daniel. So I'm going to talk about why Daniel should have given up, why Daniel should have given up, and all of us have been here. We've all felt this way. Number one, he was taken away from home, and it seemed that God was gone. Have you ever had that moment that you felt like God was not around? The Lord allowed Nebuchadnezzar to capture Jehoiakim, king of Judah. Nebuchadnezzar also took some of the things from the temple of God, which he carried to Babylonia and put in the temple of his gods. Born in Arizona, moved to Babylonia. All right. So what was he doing? And by the way, this is really cool. If you get on Wikipedia right now, you will. Can we go back to that verse for just a minute? I wasn't going to go there yet. Just camp there for a second. Okay. The Lord allowed Nebuchadnezzar. By the way, I love the way the name is spelled. Any name with two Z's is just awesome. Somebody needs to put, get, next time you have a kid, if you ever have kids, young people, put a couple Z's in their name just for fun. Anyway, so Nebuchadnezzar. So one of the longest kings. Here's the deal. 
they actually, uh, uh, when they were digging, found a plaque from him, and it talks about how he rebuilt his temple. And one of the things he did was take the spoils of war, and he actually took gold from the Jewish temple. Took the gold, took the fine things, and he put it in the temple of his God. And here's what that meant. Back then, they felt like if you won in war, it meant your God was stronger. And so as they were taken from home, they were taken and they were taken over to Babylon. By the way, that was a 500-mile trip. Most scholars believe it took them 900 miles, though, because of the way they had to go. Imagine being taken from your homeland. Probably your parents were killed. Other family members were killed. You saw the ravages of war. And now you were in chains headed to modern day Iraq. Anybody want that trip? Anybody? Anybody? One way trip to Iraq in chains. Anybody? I don't even think I could walk the 900 miles. But anyway, I could walk 500 miles. But anyway, that's another story. So, by the way, Saddam Hussein even tried to rebuild what Nebuchadnezzar built. Did you know that? And so uh, there were 11 miles of walls around the city. And then here's the Ishtar Gate. This was just, this was the smaller of the gates. This is actually in a museum in Germany. Uh, most of the stones are original. That blue stone, you cannot tell uh, from here. I actually had a jeweler come to me last night and said, do you know that? And she told me what it was called. I don't have it with me. She told me what it was called, but it's some kind of expensive blue stone. And it's got a really cool name. And he actually, and if you look like King Tut, remember King Tut had that mask? His eyebrows were made with that blue stuff. I mean, that's all they did. Nebuchadnezzar was so awesome that he said, I'm going to do this gate, these walls. And then they had a gate that was like twice as big as this one. This one is 50 foot high. And a, a hundred, I think it's, hang on, sorry, I lost my name. 50 foot and four stories high and a hundred foot wide. And you'll notice there's dragons and bulls on this wall. So you would come into the city. This is the small gate. And then there was a, then there was a half mile long, uh, 50 foot high walls on both sides you would have been walked through. And then a gate that was even bigger than this one that they couldn't even re redo. And on that wall were these. This is actually from the Met in New York. Um, it's one of the few museums that has one of the lions. Isn't that ironic? What's that? Iron. Nice. <laughs> it has one of the lines. And so here's the deal. This was a half mile long. There were over a hundred of these lines. If you stood, and by the way, they did the lines about this high, an actual size of a lion. So as you walked, you walked through this. This represented their god Ishtar, which was a terrible movie, but, but there it is, okay? Uh, so you can imagine coming into the city, and here's all these lions. And remember later under Darius, Daniel was tried, they tried to feed him to the lions, a representation. We're going to give you to our God and see what happens. And so as they walked in, they saw all of these things. I'm sure even on the journey, some of the young men died. It would be easy to despair. And let me tell you what happens when we get afraid or we get discouraged. We tell ourselves a story. Fear begins to tell you a story. And I can tell you right now, I'm sure most of the young men on that trek were saying, God has left us. They actually say in Jewish folklore that many of the Jews that end up in Babylon began worshiping other gods. Why? Because the story they told themselves was, God is gone, you're on your own. He was never real to begin with. Whatever they would tell. Listen, in your life, when you feel like God is far from you, you begin to make up a story. Maybe it's that God, like it said earlier, God doesn't care about you. He's forgotten you. Or you did some sin that God can't forgive and he's left you. The truth is he's never left you. The Bible says he'll never leave you or forsake you. Here's the second thing that happened to Daniel and his friends. He lost his identity, his family, and his friends. Some of you have had that happen when something bad happened to you in your life. All of a sudden, people that you thought were friends, you found out they're not my friends. People who you thought were on your side were all of a sudden against you, and you were surprised by all of it, and you were devastated. Can you imagine the shock that these guys had? Ashpenaz, the chief officer, gave them Babylonian names. Daniel's new name was Belteshazzar. By the way, you'll notice Daniel's never called Belteshazzar. He's always called Daniel. 
Hananiah's name became Shadrach. Mesh uh, Michelle's was Meshach, gosh, my mouth, and Azariah was Abednego, or as we like to call him once again, Rack, Shack, and Benny. If you had lost everything, what story would you tell yourself? Some of you guys have gone through trials and bankruptcy and devastation and job loss. And if you're not careful, you'll begin to tell us a story of fear. Things will never get better. You'll begin to lose hope. If you've lost someone you've loved, if you just feel lost, you've gone through a divorce, you've gone through a really hard move, and all of a sudden you felt like, I don't have anybody or anything. Daniel knew exactly how you felt. Number three, he was also under constant threat and harassment. When the king heard their answer, he became very angry. Now, at this point, Daniel was promoted. He became one of the wise men, or as the three stooges call them, wise guys, right? So he became one of the wise guys, and these wise guys, the king would call on them to interpret dreams, to tell them what was coming up, which Daniel was good at because God gave him wisdom. Listen to what happened, though. So he gets moved up, and can you imagine you get moved up, and now the position you're in, they decide to kill you. Now, some of you have gotten moved into positions where all of a sudden they eliminate your position. Imagine if you were moved into a position, and then they said, we're going to eliminate you. Oh, you mean I don't work here anymore? No, no. You don't work anywhere anymore. So here's what happened. When the king heard their answer, he became very angry. Never a good thing for a king. He ordered that all the wise men of Babylon be killed. At that point, I'd be like, I'm not that wise. <laughs> so King Nebuchadnezzar ordered to kill the wise men was announced, and the men were sent to look for Daniel and his friends to kill them. I know you've had bad days, but I don't think anybody's coming after you. Assi people were assigned to look for them and kill them. I don't know what story you tell yourself when you're under stress, but I can imagine Daniel's story that day was, oh my goodness. When you get under stress, you begin to feel like you just can't handle anymore. <laughs> All your good habits begin to go away. You let fear dominate. You begin to only see the fear and the thing, the person or the thing coming after you. The thing that seems like a failure attacks you. And you begin to tell yourself a story. And this will never change. You begin to feel like you're hit with wave after wave. Can you imagine how they felt? They'd already been taken away from home, away from their family. They were in Iraq. And now they had somebody trying to kill them. Number four. Then years later, Daniel's promoted. He, he, we know the story. He interprets dreams and all this stuff. And the king loves him. He's on king number three now, this guy named Darius. And he becomes a politician. But he's so wholesome and so righteous. And he keeps getting things right. The other ones get jealous of him. So they want to get him killed. So they start looking for reasons to kill him. And here's what it says. Oh, number four was, sorry, anyway. Even after earning trust, jealous people look to attack him. Daniel 6 says this. Because of this, the other supervisors and governors tried to find a reason to accuse Daniel about his work in the government. But they could not find anything wrong with him or any reason to accuse him. Because, now compare your politician to these three words. Trustworthy, not lazy, and if they pass that muster, dishonest. By the way, if you're sitting there right now going, my politician is none of those things, okay. We're just going to let you keep believing that for another six weeks. What story do you tell yourself when people betray you? You hate them? You deserve to be hated? When people come after you, what, do you, what story do you tell yourself? He was an old man at this point. He had earned his keep. He had shown over and over he was loyal. And yet now the people that should be his friends, the people he worked with, attacked him. Those closest to him. Have you ever been attacked? C.S. Lewis says this. Hardships often prepare ordinary people for an extraordinary destiny. So now that I've depressed you, how did Daniel overcome? 
What was the thing in his life that as the wind of life blew, what were the things that staked him, that kept him connected to God, that kept him from blowing away and life getting after him? And here's some principles that you and I can use in our lives. Number one, we need to keep learning and growing in adversity. Now, this is the last thing on your mind when you're going through pain. But let me let you know something about pain. Pain is an awesome teacher. And it's one of the best times to learn. I can't tell you the number of times that as people go through something, I never hear from them. And all of a sudden they call me, hey, um, can we talk a little bit? They show up in my office and I say, you realize I'm the worst counselor on earth, right? Yes, I do realize that. Okay, good. Let's talk. And so they begin to talk and tell me stuff. And then here's what I do. A lot of times I'm saying to them, hey, here's a great book you can read. Here's something that you can do. Here's a principle you can do. And when people get desperate and begin to hurt, guess what they do? They begin to change. We don't change until pain happens. Listen to what happened to Daniel and his friends. God gave these four young men wisdom and the ability to learn many things, listen, that people had written and studied. Time out. You know what that means? They were taken to a foreign land in chains. They were miles and miles from home. They walked up on this huge wall with lions and tigers and bears, oh my, and all of this stuff. They were in a foreign culture. I'm sure any time they misbehaved, people were wiped out. People were killed. There were all kind of dangers. And what did these guys do? They went to the library. Listen to what it says. They went to the library. They had the ability to learn many things that people had written and people had studied. So they went and they decided we're going to learn. As long as we're here, as long as we're in this painful place, we're going to go ahead and use the pain and this tragedy. We're going to look for anything that's good around us. We're going to go to the library. Every time the king asked them about something important, they showed much wisdom and understanding. They were ten times, listen, ten times better than the fortune tellers and magicians in his kingdom. So Daniel continued to be the servant until the first king servant, until the first year that Cyrus was king. Painful times are learning time, but it's easy to get focused on the wrong things. Listen, during painful times, you'll find out who your real friends are. During painful times, you'll become more discerning. During painful times, when you do something dumb, you'll hopefully go, I won't do that again. Hopefully you won't be the person that has four or five retakes. God never fails you, by the way. He just gives retakes and retakes and retakes. I love this quote. And I know my friend Tracy will love this. Just when the caterpillar thought its world was over, it became a butterfly. So many times it feels like life is over when we're in pain when God is using that to transform us, to change us. Here's the story I want you to tell yourself the next time you have pain. God, even in this pain, I know you maybe didn't cause this, maybe it was somebody else, maybe it was my own choice, but even in this pain, you can use it for your purpose. God, help me to learn. And by the way, if you get stuck, whether it's in grief or pain, get somebody to talk to, get a counselor to talk to. Don't get stuck just in the pain. If you're not moving forward, if you find yourself stuck somewhere day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, get some folks to help you to move forward. Number two, praise God in fear and trials. Now you say, oh, Eric, it's easy for you to say. You're not going through trials. Daniel, remember they were, the king wanted to kill him. Daniel asked for an interpretation of his dream. Before he ever goes to the king, he says this. I don't know about you, but I would have been thinking, I hope the king, I hope my presentation to the king will be really good. I would be getting my PowerPoint ready. But that's not what Daniel does. Listen, I thank you and praise you, God of my ancestors, because you've given me wisdom and power. You told me what we asked of you. You told me about the king's dream. Instead of walking in fear and worrying about what's next, how about if we begin to say, God, even with a threat, even with everything that could go wrong, I want to be grateful for what you've given me. By the way, they found that one of the differences between people who fall and stay on the mat and people who rise up strong, one of the number one things is gratefulness. 
When's the last time you just made a gratefulness list? God, thank you for this. God, thank you for that. Because too many times, like I said, we get focused on the thing. And instead of focusing on what could go wrong, Daniel begins saying, God, thank you for these things. Thank you for what you've given me. Keep learning. We talk about keep learning and keep growing and then praising God. Then number three, be humble knowing God can use you. Daniel says this. So Daniel goes to the king. And the king pretty much praises him. By the way, we already know that they were ten times better than everybody else. But listen to what Daniel says. God also told this secret to me, not because I have greater wisdom than any other living person, but so that you, king, might know what it means. And that way you'll understand what went through your mind. Daniel could have easily said, I don't deserve, King, I don't deserve to be treated the way I'm treated. I want to go back home. I, I want this to happen. I want that. Instead, he said, you know what? I'm not even that smart. But God can use me. You may be here today and you may feel like God can't use me. I want you to know, God can use you. And instead of trying to get the fame and instead of trying to get the credit, you know what Daniel did? He said, it's all about him. Do you realize that God can use you not because of you, but because of him? Not because of your degree, not because of how smart you are, or quick you are, or pure you are, or how together you are, but because he can use you if you're available. Number four. If you miss everything else in the sermon, hear number four. It will change your life. Overcome evil with good. On one of the hardest days of my life, I did something that I've done ever since I left Quincy's years and years ago as a waiter. I know some of you suddenly just thought, big fat yeast roll, right? I got you. Boy, they were good. Just made my mouth water. There we go. Overcome evil with good. On one of my worst days, I remember I went to a restaurant. I bought a $20 meal. And when I was done, I left a $50 tip. And I said, you know what? On my worst day, at least somebody can have a good day. But it's amazing how when you do a little thing that's good, how God blesses you. One of the neatest things, I had an opportunity, um, our crossing guards uh, kind of live in our neighborhood. And so uh, one of the crossing guards, I went to my uh, 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 favorite restaurant, McDonald's. And um, as I was, I, I would say it's not my favorite restaurant, but as many times as I go a week, I'm, I, I, I can't deny it. And those of you who think that McDonald's is bad and you don't go there, you're a liar. Anyway, so um, we... <laughs> I only eat the health food and anything else that gets in my car. So, um, so, but anyway, and I see the crossing guard going in and I was able to say to the lady, hey, hey, can you, um, can I give you money and you give him a gift certificate? She said, oh yeah, I can do that. So I gave her money, she gave him, never even knew it. Can I tell you that that changed my whole mood that day? Why? Because even in difficulty, when you do something that's right, God uses it to change you. Even though Daniel knew the new law had been written. Remember those guys came after him. And they, they made a law that if you worship anybody but the king, you'll be killed. The new law had been written. What did he do? He went to pray upstairs in the upstairs room in his house. They had windows that opened towards Jerusalem. Hey, the temple wasn't even there. The stuff had been taken. That stuff was in the temple there in Ishtar. But he continued to pray. He continued to have faith. Three times a day, Daniel would kneel down and pray, listen, and thank God, just as he had always done. Do you take time to thank God every day? Do you take time when evil comes and something bad happens, instead of withdrawing, which is what we want to do, instead of getting discouraged, instead of pouting, doing something right? Because on your worst day, you may not be able to change the circumstance. You may not be able to change a person that hurt you. You may not be able to change the failure that you had, but you can do something right. And so no matter what's happened in your past, no matter how much you want to say, I give up, I'm not doing anymore, I'm tired of people, I'm not going to church anymore, I, I tried to be nice and that person wasn't nice back. I tried to do something and I was punished for it. I, I helped somebody and because I helped them, I ended up hurting myself and blah, 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 blah. Instead of withdrawing, say, you know what, I'm just going to do what's right. I'm going to do what this next verse says, Romans 12, 21. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Don't just focus on the evil and the things that have hurt you. Look for what you can do that's good. Just one little habit, just one little change, 
Just one little going out of your way to be a blessing to somebody. God can use that very thing. Not just to change them, but to change you. So if we're going to grow in a trial, we keep learning. We praise God. We, we say, God, I'm going to be humble, but I trust you. And then we overcome. And then finally, this is really what happens. This really isn't one of the steps. This is what happens when you trust God. When you trust God, you will watch him transform those around you. So remember, at least 40 years before, as Daniel had walked into the city, he saw all those lions. And when he didn't obey the king, the new king Darius decided, you know what? Whoever doesn't obey is going to be fed to the lions. Darius loved Daniel, so he was upset. But because he had put it in writing, he knew he had to do. He had been tricked, and he had to do what those guys said because he had put it in writing. And so Daniel was putting the lions den, and the next day, Darius came out and he said, Did your God save you from my God? Did your God save you from the lions? Daniel says this. O king, live forever. That's so awesome. He starts by how to win friends and influence people. <laughs> o king, we should greet each other that way. Hey, Robert, live forever. Right? I'd be like, no thanks. 80 years, probably good. I'm already sore, so my back hurts. <laughs> Daniel answered, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel to close the lion's mouth. They've not hurt me. Why? Because my God knows I am innocent. I never did anything wrong to you, O king. King Darius was very happy. And he told his servants, lift Daniel out of the lion's den. So they lifted him out and didn't find any injury on him because Daniel had trusted in his God. By the way, when that king was happy, he was so happy he threw the other guys in there. And the Bible says before they even hit the ground, they were eaten. Those lions were hungry. They sat all night going, really, angel, we're starving here. Gabriel's like, dude, you know, I was just sent by the boss and you guys are going to have to wait. But I think tomorrow is going to be good for you. So. <laughs> Now, God has called us to be more than conquerors, but you may feel like your story is over. You may look at your life and say, Eric, I've had a failure. I've had a trial. But if you'll obey God, if you'll listen to him, if you'll overcome evil with good in your life and allow God through the power of Jesus Christ, the Bible says that he will never leave us or forsake us. In Philippians 4.13, it says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. See, about 500 years after the time of Daniel, three guys left, well, or at least three people left the Babylon area. Three of those wise men, astronomers, astrologers, whatever you want to call them. They'd seen the stars and they knew something had changed. And because they had heard the stories of Daniel, they knew something was going on. They saw a change in the star. And so they followed a star into Bethlehem. And they brought gifts to the king that Daniel had prophesied many years before. And they brought gold and frankincense and myrrh. Most theologians believe that those three things came from Babylon. The only reason that people in Babylon would know anything about a future king, a Messiah, would be because of Daniel and his friends. And here Daniel was the head wise man. And guess who came to see Jesus? Wise men from the Middle East. You may feel like your influence is over. But it could be that something that God uses in your life, just you going through a trial may show somebody else that God is real. And it may you may think, well, my life is done. And it may be that somebody sees what God does with you and they begin to trust him. About two years ago, one of my friends who was an atheist called me and he said, I wanted to tell you something. I believe in God now. And I said, OK, it's a big change. What happened? He goes. Because I've seen how God has taken care of you, and there's no reason for that to happen unless it was God. So I believe in God. I'm not so sure about the Jesus stuff yet, but I believe in God. And I'm hoping one day that same friend will call me and say, Eric, I believe in Jesus now. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, I want you to know that the Bible says 
that Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you're here today and you want to give your life to Christ, in a few minutes we're going to have our offering and then I'll be here after the service. I know we've gone a few minutes over time, but I thought it was worth it to end the series. You think that was all right today? Yeah. 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 But if you're here and you want to pray, I'd love to talk to you after the service. Maybe you're here and you're a Christian, and one of those habits that I talked about, you said, I never do that. It's time to change. And today could be the day for transformation. Ask God, God, would you begin to put that? Maybe it's study. Maybe it's learning. Maybe it's releasing somebody who's hurt you. Maybe it's owning it. Maybe it's moving forward in your life and saying, God, I want to do that. I encourage you, don't let another day go by without doing what God's called you to do today. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I thank you for the life of Daniel. Father, I thank you for all the adversity he went through, and yet we see how it changed history. And Father, we still read about Daniel, and we still look at the prophecies, and he even talked about things that are coming. And Father, we see how you used an ordinary young man who chose to serve you in the midst of adversity and pain. Lord, if we're honest, sometimes when the pain comes, we don't want to deal with it. Sometimes we want to hide, we want to run, but Father, we thank you that you said you would never leave us or forsake us. Lord, I pray if anyone in here doesn't know you, that today would be the day they turn their life and their heart to you. Thank you for this time, Jesus. We're going to sing a song.